Well, John tells us that his goal in writing his gospel uh, is that we might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing we might have life in his name. Christ, of course, means king. Palm Sunday is about a royal procession. And here are three facets of Jesus' kingship that are described in the story that, that invite us to a new or renewed belief, new or renewed hope today. First, uh, to believe in the king who comes to defend the vulnerable, to believe in the king who gathers the broken, and to believe in the king who exhausts violence. And this is what I invite you to this morning, to believe in the king who defends the vulnerable. So what was Jesus doing the night before his parade into Jerusalem? He was the guest of honor at a dinner party. Let me just reread this uh, for us, beginning of chapter 12. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Uh, in John's gospel, the resurrection uh, by Jesus of Lazarus happens just in the preceding chapter. Uh, so this is fresh news at the time. Uh, they gave a dinner party for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. It's a celebration meal. Lazarus is alive. And you think, I mean, what kind of meal would that have been uh, to have a, a man who had been dead sharing a meal with the man who had raised him from death? Like, what would they have talked about? I mean, it's fascinating to think about. But it, it is also a meal with an aura of vulnerability around it. Because the religious leadership are already plotting Jesus' demise. In verse 57 of chapter 11, Now the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where Jesus was, uh, he should let him know so that they might arrest him. So Jesus is, as he shows up for this dinner in Bethany, vulnerable to any snitch looking for quick cash. Anyone looking for an in with the religious leadership. And we know, because we know more of the story, that Judas Iscariot, the one who will betray Jesus, is in the mix. Jesus is not the only one who's vulnerable. His friends are vulnerable too. Verse 9 of chapter 12, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus, that Jesus was there. They came not only on account of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So Lazarus is himself living proof that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Uh, he is living proof of what Jesus announced, that whoever believes in him, though he die, yet shall he live. Uh, he is exhibit A, uh, that everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And Lazarus is vulnerable too. It's interesting. You would think, you know, that this is a high point moment for Lazarus, but there is also a lot of vulnerability wrapped around it because the chief priests had made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. And again, if, if you're curious about Christianity, if you're just here on a Sunday morning and you're checking Jesus out, it's important to see in these notes in the story that the message of Christianity is tied to historical evidence, that, that it is tied to events that happened in time. And the religious leadership know uh, that so long as Lazarus is living and breathing and walking around and able to tell his story, I once was dead, but now I'm alive again, that, that as long as he is walking around, there, there is an evidential problem. There's a question that has to be asked. Hey, Lazarus, how is it that you came to be alive again? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. And the leadership understand that they have got now a Jesus problem and a Lazarus problem. But there's another group of people who are vulnerable too. I don't know if they understand how vulnerable they are. They probably do. Uh, and that is the crowd the crowd who welcomes Jesus is also vulnerable. You think, how are they vulnerable? Well, they are people who live in an occupied country. They are 
living in their homeland. Their homeland is occupied by the Roman army. They're subject to uh, the whim of Roman soldiers. They're subject to the degradation of Roman taxation. They're subject to Roman governance. They're vulnerable. And, And not only are they vulnerable in the moment, but the Passover feast which they've come up to Jerusalem to celebrate reminds them that their entire history is one of vulnerability. Their ancestors enslaved in Egypt, vulnerable to a cruel pharaoh who at one point ordered the male children of Israel to be executed, vulnerable to punitive slave tasks, more bricks, less straw. Even in celebrating Passover, they're reminded that God's deliverance via the blood of Passover lamb spread over doorposts holds a lesson uh, that none of us can save ourselves. The crowd is vulnerable. We're vulnerable. Where this week did you feel vulnerable? Did you feel vulnerable this week? I I thought about teachers and students and folks who work in school, walking by school resource officers, police officers in school, a, a reminder of vulnerability. Vulnerable feeling powerless to solve problems. Maybe it's not about the week's headline. You, you may live vulnerably every day in a relationship that is not as safe as you want it to be. You might have a job that's not as secure as you need it to be. Your heart might be more prone to wander, more sinful than you want to say out loud. You are vulnerable to yourself. And one of the vulnerable at this dinner party, Mary, she seizes the moment. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, you might remember, if you've heard the lesson before, that from the New Testament perspective in that culture, uh, a woman's hair was considered her glory. It was not let down in public. Uh, it It was kept up. It was to be let down for her husband in privacy, for a woman to let her hair down in public was to make herself vulnerable. It was a sign of intimacy. The, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 says, uh, if a woman has long hair, it's her glory. And so there is a way in which Mary lets down her hair vulnerably and reveals her glory. She does this action, this anointing of Jesus in a way that is public, intimate, and scandalous. She makes herself vulnerable before Jesus. She makes herself vulnerable before her siblings, Martha and Lazarus. She makes herself vulnerable before the crowd. She makes herself vulnerable before anybody walking by the house who catches a scent of the perfume. She makes herself vulnerable before everybody. And of course, which, which always happens when we make ourselves vulnerable, we open ourselves up to being misunderstood, which is uh, Judas's role in this story. Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray Jesus, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it, he, uh, he, uh, he shames Mary a little bit, doesn't he? What's she doing? Well, Jesus knows what she's doing. Jesus knows there's something bigger going on. She said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. And Jesus is not making a dismissive comment about the poor, but what he is doing is he is recognizing that this is a pivotal moment really in his story, hence in human history, uh, that he is about to die, that he is about to be buried, that, that Mary uh, either understands or intuits more than the crowd what is ahead for Jesus. Jesus. 
She has made herself vulnerable. She has revealed her glory publicly. She has revealed this intimately. She has revealed it scandalously in order to anoint Jesus for his great moment of vulnerability. She becomes vulnerable to prepare Jesus to be vulnerable because Jesus will achieve maximum vulnerability in ways public, intimate, and scandalous. And as Mary has at that dinner party revealed her glory, Jesus' glory will be revealed at the cross. God the Son making himself incredibly vulnerable, vulnerable to the point of death in order to do what? In order to defend the vulnerable. That's what this week is about, to, to defend those who need defended, who are vulnerable in the face not only of occupying armies, not only vulnerable in the face of being misunderstood, but vulnerable to the sin that lurks within, vulnerable to our own unrighteousness, which needs a solution which we cannot provide for ourselves. Jesus has come to make himself vulnerable to defend us, we who are vulnerable. Do you believe that? Do you believe that that is part of the story that Jesus has come to defend the vulnerable? He also comes to gather the broken. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And the crowd sings the song, part of which we used in our call to worship, uh, with uh, much intention. One of the things I love about worship at NPC is the way that Paul chooses songs with intention to fit in our service. The crowd is singing uh, Psalm 118 with intention because Psalm 118 is a song that describes God's rescue and lifting up of his king. And the first half of Psalm 118 describes God rescuing his king. Just for example, uh, verse 5 of Psalm 118, Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. And, and the second half of Psalm 118 describes God's people praising God for rescuing his king. Uh, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And then verse 26, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And in Psalm 118, what is being pictured is the arrival of the king at the temple and being uh, hailed by God's people at the temple in Jerusalem as Jesus was doing, as he was riding up into Jerusalem. He is acting out Psalm 118, and the crowd is participating in this. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, we're told. Now, Palm Sunday sermons from time immemorial have contrasted Jesus' choice of animal, a donkey, with, with whatever uh, the most aggressive form of military transport was at that point in time in history. I imagine in, uh, you know, the, the 400s, some famous preacher would say, you know, Jesus rode up into Jerusalem on a donkey, not like on a, a war horse. Or, you know, we might say Jesus rode up into Jerusalem on a donkey and not in an M1 tank or something like that. Donkeys are ridden by peace-making, peace-bringing kings. And Jesus rides gently into Jerusalem. John the Gospel writer is quoting the prophet Zechariah to explain the gentle arrival of God's king and the character of God's people. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now, daughter of Zion is a curious expression. And there's actually more going on here than uh, immediately meets the eye. Because for Jesus to ride gently and for the people to be described as daughter of Zion creates 
uh, attention that we need to understand. Here's why. In, in the Old Testament, uh, the expression daughter of Zion can describe Jerusalem and the people who live there, uh, maybe kind of just a, a generic, almost nicknamed the daughter of Zion. But as I explored the expression a couple of years ago, I found that daughter of Zion often describes God's people in their brokenness. Daughter of Zion often describes God's people in their spiritual anxiety, in their spiritual extremity. Let me give you a couple of illustrations for that. Uh, the prophet Isaiah describes the Assyrian king who was Israel's enemy, not a friend of Israel, describing uh, the Israelites as despicable, despising you, the virgin daughter of Jerusalem. But also... Isaiah describes the daughter of uh, Jerusalem, uh, daughters of Zion, as arrogant and liable to God's judgment in Isaiah 3. Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion. So, so uh, the expression describes God's people when they're mocked by outsiders, but it also describes God's people in their, uh, in their pridefulness before God. And then Isaiah 52, uh, shake yourself from the dust and arise, be seated, O Jerusalem, loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. So, so daughter of Zion uh, as she is mocked, daughter of Zion as she is rebellious, daughter of Zion as she is broken and grieving. Jeru uh, Jeremiah describes Jerusalem awaiting disaster in this way, as the cry of the daughter of Zion gasping for breath. Stretching out her hands, woe is me, I am fading before murderers. And then in Lamentations, Jeremiah again, from the daughter of Zion, all her majesty has departed. So when Jesus rides gently up to and amongst the daughters of Zion, he is riding gently among those who would be described as proud, judged, captive, broken as a consequence of their own sin, lamentable. What if, uh, there's a little bit of a stretch here. I understand there's some problems with the illustration you're about to hear. Uh, that's my legal disclaimer. But what if Jesus' parade ended at your home? and not the temple. Here's the king on a donkey, crowd all around. You come to the door. The king greets you. What is he like? Is he angry? Is he frustrated with everything that makes you, that would make me lamentable? See, here's the thing. The, the king still rides gently towards us when we realize that we're not different than the daughters of Zion, that there are ways in which we are broken. There are unbeliefs or misbehaviors that we are captive to. There are ways in which people look down on us. The king rides gently towards broken people. There is a day of judgment. That's Friday. The day of judgment for Jesus is on Good Friday. And the day of judgment for every person who believes in Jesus is on Good Friday. And the day of judgment for those who don't believe in Jesus is in the future. Because sin will be accounted for. But at this moment in time, the king still rides gently towards the broken. Palm Sunday is a fact of history. Jesus really did ride among the God rejectors, the selfish, the blaspheming, the fake worshipers, those with shaky relationships and friendships. He rides among us gently. He rides among us gently and compassionately because 
The parade is not the end of the story. The parade is how we get to the end of the story. The, the, the parade is going to result in a cross. And the cross is going to lead to an empty tomb. And the empty tomb is going to lead to an ascended king. All of which is to say he can ride gently among the broken because he is going to atone for what makes us lamentable. He is going to pay for what makes us lamentable. And he's going to do this thirdly in a way that exhausts violence. The same king who gathers the broken will also exhaust violence and bring peace. The next verse is from Zechariah, the Old Testament prophet from whom uh, much of the background of Palm Sunday is understood. Uh, the next verses of Zechariah inform the peace-bringing mission behind Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. So verse 10 from Zechariah 9, uh, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So whether you're super familiar with Palm Sunday, uh, you know, some years ago you were the one up front uh, waving the palm fronds and your parents were taking uh, pictures, however they were taken in that era of time, Polaroids perhaps, uh, although I understand the Polaroids making a comeback. Uh, uh, if you're super familiar with Palm Sunday and you've heard it all before, uh, or if it's new to you, I invite you to ponder this, uh, that Jesus comes gently not just for the daughters of Zion, but for the broken of every nation. That his competence to bring peace is a result of the blood that he sheds to win that peace. But here's, here's what needs repondered. That Jesus does not parade into Jerusalem to shed other people's blood to bring peace. That Jesus parades into Jerusalem and there's really only one person whose blood is going to be shed. To bring peace. He parades into Jerusalem so that his blood will be shed. And Zechariah, all the way back in the Old Testament, anticipates this in verse 11. But as for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you Double. Now, per the scholars who think these things out, Zechariah's reference to the blood of the covenant is doing two things here. Zechariah kind of lived between the Exodus and Jesus. So in the Exodus, at one point, Moses sprinkles blood on the people as God makes a covenant with them. Zechariah is looking back at that event, that covenant-making event, the blood of the covenant, but that blood of the covenant looks forward to the cross because it's rooted in the Passover. So there is wrapped in this verse an indication of the sacrifice of the final Passover lamb so that God will keep his covenant to bring peace to the nations. Violence is an ever-present reality. It's a, a, a horrible reality of the world in which we live. But one of the things that I want us to see here is that Jesus exhausts the power of violence at the cross. Individual violence, intranational violence, the violent power of the dark spiritual realm. And he does this not by becoming more violent, but by publicly absorbing the worst that violence has to offer. And the prophets anticipate the peace bringing mission of the king. He shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. 
And in the very next section of John's gospel, which we looked at last week, a little bit out of sequence, but the Greeks show up to, to inquire about Jesus. The nations come to Jesus. That's the next thing that happens in the story. But, but on a Sunday after horrible violence has touched the church, CPC Nashville specifically, our denomination generally, Jesus' church a little more generally, what does it mean to follow a king whose own blood is our peace? Well, first, we have real confidence that in the face of horrible violence, peace will prevail ultimately. Not because we wish it to be so, but because at the cross, Jesus absorbed the, the, the worst that violence has to offer, which is the death of the Son of God. And, and, and if the the, the Son of God can absorb the worst that violence can do and then emerge through the other side of it, then ultimately the power of violence is exhausted. We accept in faith that we live between Jesus' exhaustion of violence's power at the cross, the, the, the power of violence to shape human destiny. You know, violence says, hey, I, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to shape destiny, whether it's the, the individual destiny of someone that I'm being violent to individually, or I'm going to shape the destiny of nations as nations war against nations. I'm going to shape human destiny by being violent. I, I, I'm going to build a better future by being worse. <laughs> And Jesus comes at the cross and he says, you're actually not going to be able to build a future through violence ultimately. That ultimately every future built by violence is going to be brought to conclusion and judgment. But the reality is Jesus is going to build the best of all possible futures by absorbing violence himself. So, so that there is no ultimate power in violence. Now, we live between the times, which means that we will still experience violence, but we do experience violence, however it is painful, as really kind of the death throes, the, the death thrashings of, uh, of a violence that can't achieve what it wants to achieve. We accept that in faith. Come quickly, O Lord. I do think we also need to think and pray deeply about how Jesus' nonviolent confrontation of violence shapes us. I'm not talking about uh, the role of the state in defending life or property or executing justice. This is established in the New Testament. I, I'm talking more personally uh, about constantly and reflectively putting our hearts before the king to discern where the violent values of this world creep into our own hearts. And this, by the way, is not about gun ownership primarily, because this relates to people who choose to own guns and to people who choose to not own guns. This is about the heart of every kind of person, because really this is the question that the larger catechism of the church poses to us with respect to the sixth commandment, the sixth commandment, you shall not kill, uh, poses uh, the, the answer to the question, what are the duties required by the sixth commandment? And it is a fascinating and reflective answer. And I'm actually going to read it for us because one answer, it, it's not the only answer, but, but if you wondered at any point this week in, in the wake of any of the news about any of the violent events that have been reported, like, what could I do? One thing you can do, and that I can do, is I can subject my heart to interrogation in making sure that my heart is being discipled away from violence. So I'm, I'm going to read the answer, and then I'm going to make a few expansive comments, and then we'll be done. Now, this is written in the 1640s. It sounds remarkably current. The duties required in the Sixth Commandment are all careful studies and lawful endeavors to preserve the life of ourselves and others. How? 
by resisting all thoughts, if I could just get my hands on, and purposes, subduing all passions, and avoiding all occasions, temptations, and practices which tend to the unjust taking away of the life of any. Do you have anger that you need to bring before the king? Do you have anger that you need to let him interrogate? There's a whole spectrum of applications just in that sentence. Everything from subjecting our entertainment to the king's review. I, I, will, I will confess here just because we're being vulnerable, you and me, except it's only me. Uh, I, I like a good spy movie. Uh, and, you know, usually the dramatic element of a good spy movie involves some kind of crime, and it's usually some kind of violent. I had to turn two off last week because I just couldn't put those things in front of my eyes. The violence was too much. We're talking about practices which tend to the unjust taking away of the life of any. You could throw something uh, as, <laughs> uh, as, I mean, mundane, I suppose, as not texting and driving into that, which could lead to the accidental but unjust taking of a life. The catechism continues uh, that um, we're to pursue just defense thereof against violence, patient bearing of the hand of God, quietness of mind, cheerfulness of spirit. And then catch this, sober use of meat, drink, physic, I think by which they mean medicine, sleep, labor, and recreations. In other words, living a balanced life. Living a balanced life helps preserve the lives of others. You're like, really? I thought that was just good mental hygiene. How could that be? Well, just for example, when I live within my means and I budget to be generous, I have more in my power to give away to support others' lives. Just as an example, the catechism continues. By charitable thoughts. Are you prone to believe the best or the worst about people reflexively? Something happens. Do you rush to judgment or do you rush to charity? If you rush to judgment, one way that you can pursue nonviolence is by praying that you would rush more towards charity. The, the catechism continues that we pursue love, compassion, meekness, gentleness, kindness, peaceableness, mild and courteous speech and behavior. You see, there are people who would never throw a punch in public who will kill a person with a keyboard. Forbearance. Readiness to be reconciled. How much verbal violence results in holding grudges? Patient bearing and forgiving of injuries. And requiting good for evil. Comforting and succoring the distressed. And protecting and defending the innocent. Now, I'm not suggesting that repentant reflection is the only answer to our society's problems. What I am suggesting is that there are places where all of us may be more cozy to violence than we realize. And repentance starts with us. Repentance starts with us. That, that we can resist and repent where violence shapes our thinking or our living. So these are my invitations to you as we come to the Lord's table. First, to believe in the King who gathers the vulnerable. If you feel vulnerable this morning, if you are vulnerable this morning, there is a King who's come to gather you. To believe in the King who gathers the broken. And then thirdly, to join with the King, to believe in the King who comes to exhaust violence, to live in that direction.